Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Craig Schmidt, the head of Global Regulatory Reporting at Citigroup, proud Carlson School alumnus and the president of the Carlson School's Alumni Board. I'll be taking over as MC of First Tuesday today, and I'm honored to attempt to fill the shoes of Dean Zahir, who will be our featured speaker today. With that, I would like to officially welcome you to First Tuesday. Thank you all for joining us today. It is my honor to introduce both the Carlson School Dean, Shri, Shri Zahir, and Wendy Nelson for today's fireside chat. But before I do that, I want to recognize First Tuesday's longstanding partners, longstanding cor corporate and media partners, Wells Fargo, and Twin Cities Business. And of course, a very special thank you to the many Carlson School of Management and University of Minnesota supporters in our audience. Specifically, I would like to welcome Regent Doug Hipsch and former University of Minnesota President Robert Brunings. Shri Zahir is the Dean of the Carlson School of Management and currently chairs the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. During her tenure as Dean, Shri has increased business community's engagement with the school, resulting in a wealth of new experiential learning opportunities for students, and has overseen introduction of new degrees in business analytics, supply chain management, marketing, finance, and and new programs in partnership with Tsinghua University in Beijing and Tongji University in Shanghai, as well as online degrees and certificates. Shri holds the Elmer L. Anderson Chair in Global Corporate Social Responsibility and her research focus is on international business, a topic in which she has published extensively. She is a fellow of the Academy of International Business and a former consulting editor of the Journal of International Business Studies. Shri announced in March, to my dismay, that she is stepping down as dean and returning to the Carlson School faculty. I know I speak for all of us in thanking Shri for her dedicated service to the Carlson School and Twin Cities business community. And many quote Shri as exceptional, intelligent, courageous, dynamic, powerful, and effective. And the list goes on and on, it's all good. Um, but I know Shri for her fun-loving, charismatic charm that she displays often with that special smile. So Shri will be joining on stage today by Wendy Nelson. Wendy is a member of the third generation of the Carlson family, sitting at this table right here, and has many roles within Carlson Enterprise, including serving as chair of the Carlson Family Foundation. Wendy has extensive experience in business, nonprofits, and athletics. At this moment, she is focused on impact through governance and serves on numerous nonprofit boards, as well as her role with the Carlson companies including Carlson School's Board of Advisors, including the Carlson School, or sorry, including the Carlson School's Board of Advisors, the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, where she is an executive council member of the Young Women's Initiative, a public-private partnership with the Minnesota Governor Tim Walz's office. She also serves on the boards for the Constellation Fund, College Bound St. Paul, Gold Meadow Park Conservancy, I'm almost getting there, and Guthrie Theater, among others. Previously, Wendy had roles as vice chair of the Bush Foundation, co-chair of the Minnesota Super Bowl Legacy Fund, and a member of the Minnesota Super Bowl host committee, and hopefully uh, a member of the Viking Super Bowl family in, in the future. <laughs> Shri and Wendy, would you please come to the stage for today's presentation?
I think you're supposed to be here. Okay. That's a change. I'm normally <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> Is this the power seat? <laughs> uh, welcome all. I want to take just a minute uh, and, and share my gratitude, which would take up the entire hour, so I'll be brief. But if you look at Shree's record, the win is there, right? The success, the scorecard, game done, Shri won. But it's the how she got there. It's that she lifted others to lift the school and lift the community. If you look at the students and hear their stories, she relished in their stories. She thought about their dreams. If you think about the faculty, she wanted to help them with their dreams and she relished in every moment that we had a, a high ranking in terms of our faculty research and new things. When you think about community, when you think about businesses, she recognized their goals and figured out how to make their goals her own. That's what raised up the school and it's the relationships you built along the way. So it's the courage in actually being human that I want to thank you for today. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for that. You know, it's, um, you know, at the end, it's all about the people. So, you know, it's how do you get them, you know, how do you lift them up? And I think that's exactly what I hope we've all been able to do together at the Carlson School. It's, you know, it's never an individual enterprise. So thank you. Uh, well, you have, and our community always lifts each other. But, uh, but thank you for that. So today is a fireside chat. Um, we're going to have some time where I get to ask the questions. Uh, but we are going to give you an opportunity to ask the questions as well. So I wanted to start with this incredibly courageous woman. Aren't you all curious as I am how she's had so many accomplishments that she's excelled in every post in different countries and different cultures? Broken glass ceilings in academia and in leadership, sought after as a thought leader. So tell us where you came from. Tell us a little bit about the little girl Shri and your family and how that shaped and formed you. Okay, I can talk about that for a very long time too, but I'll try and be brief. But the, I mean, the real person, I, the person who has been the biggest influence in my life was my father. You know, uh, he was the one who really sort of valued education. So, you know, very, I was an afterthought in the family. So my father retired when I was 13 years old and we went back to his hometown, which was, Madras, which is now called Chennai, and that's where we were living. And in many ways, you know, I became my parents' window to the world, you know, so it was, they didn't have friends there, but, you know, this was the thing you did. You retired and you went back to your, you know, the town that you came from, and that was a thousand miles away from where they'd lived and where they had made careers and where they had friends. And so he was, um, uh, so th I ended up becoming their window to the world, which, played out in very positive ways later on. But one of the things that he did all the time was, my mother was very keen that I learned to sew and to cook and became, you know, so she was really keen that I become eligible as a bride for a suitable boy, right? <laughs> so that was her aim in life, to get me married to a suitable boy. And my father would always pull me away from the kitchen and, and every weekend, we'd take off to the USIS library at the American consulate in Madras. And this is the US Information Systems Library. And it was open, it was free, and best of all, it was air conditioned. So we could, so we could get away from the 108 degree heat and get into this library. And there I was, every week I was rifling through the Scientific American and Time Magazine and Popular Mechanics and Popular Science and and my dad was a scientist, so he loved, he'd, he'd pull out all the science magazines for me to read. And of course, Better Homes and Gardens, which introduced me to, you know, mid-century modern American architecture, which I'm passionate about. <laughs> so, you know, and it's sort of reflected where we live right now. So it's, it was a great experience, that value of education that he sort of instilled in me early on. And he was obviously a feminist at heart as well, you know, so he was, very keen that I pursue as much education as possible because he saw that as his way out. Clearly, it's, it's extraordinary. Think about that, that your, your father sort of 
boosted you up. Your mother saw the role that she wanted you to be happy right. and, and, and safe in, in, a, in an idea. And he knew that education was the key and he yeah. championed your education and you Absolutely. continued to Absolutely. champion others. Yeah. Um, I also think it's extraordinary. They often tell us that if, if you let a child teach you something as a parent, that that's a really important moment. And your parents gave you that gift or the situation gave you the gift of being that for your parents. That, yes, that too. And actually, you know, it's funny how as parents, you're always trying to be intentional about what you educate your kids on. But sometimes it's the unintentional, the failures that actually teach them so much more. You know, it's, uh, 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 that's kind of interesting. And so in my father's case, again, you know, he was a brilliant scientist, but lousy at finance. And so, you know, when he retired, we went back to his hometown with, as I mentioned, with you know, he had pretty meager savings. I mean, those numbers look atrocious now. I mean, you know, blame that on inflation. I'm sure there's some Fred colleagues here somewhere. So, you know, but it's, it really looks atrocious now. But on top of it, he got scammed. I mean, there was a cousin who put him on, in touch with a Ponzi scheme, and overnight he lost half his savings. And we were down to living on, you know, it, it sounds totally absurd right now, but it was $40 a month. I mean, at $80 a month, we had a decent lower middle class life. You know, we actually had a good rent, a three bedroom apartment, and uh, not three bedroom, three room apartment. And my father could actually run his 30 year old Morris in a, with a combination of, uh, you know, scotch tape and a little bit of uh, chewing gum and his mm -hmm. mechanical skills. He, was still, um, he still managed to have a car, which would take us to the US em uh, embassy every year, every, every week. And, uh, but it's, um, uh, but in the process, he lost so much of his money that uh, my, at that point, I was getting a scholarship of which about $8 a month, which was for, supposed to be for books and sundries. And that $8 actually put food on the table. So wow. it was kind of actually really helpful. And so to think that education could take me from where we were then to where I am now is just, I mean, it's such a powerful transformative experience and that's what I would, you know, we want to have make, make available to, you know, to anyone who wants it and to, you know, to the access to education has been so important to me. So that's been a big, big learning experience as well. And then, you know, and you mentioned this thing about allowing your children to make decisions and at some level, you know, with this, uh, with his loss and so on, you know, uh, I mean, the two, th two things, I mean, he could have blamed all kinds of things for this. He, could have blamed the scammer, blamed this cousin who introduced us him to the Ponzi scheme, blamed the system. You know, there's so many things that he could have blamed, but he never did. And it was always about looking forward and, okay, yes, here we are, yes, this has happened, we'll survive, let's pull ourselves up by the socks and look forward. And for them, it was all, him, it was always about, again, he felt that education would somehow get me out of that kind of trap, and, uh, and, and he pushed me towards that. So that, that inner confidence yeah. you have, it comes resilience. Mm -hmm. um, you knew things would be okay. Is that something that's carried with you in, in your leadership in terms of, and that courage, the courage to step out? Uh, oh, absolutely. I think it was, you know, the fact that I was, so I became a sort of a decision maker in the family or a contributor to decision maker in the family in my mid-teens as a result of all this, you know, because my money was also supporting the family and so on, so I was involved. In, any kind of decisions that were being made. And uh, that certainly gave me a ton of courage and, uh, and sometimes not in entirely the ways my parents would have wanted, especially not my mother. So I didn't marry a suitable boy, I married a most unsuitable boy. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he was, you know, he was devilishly good looking and had a fantastic voice that could launch a thousand ships. And you know, some of you know him, he's not here today because he's doing the hard work of you know, teaching in our executive education program at the Carlson School, that's his ax, for those of you who know him. But he was an extremely unsuitable boy. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about that, the unsuitable boy. Um, I, um, you were, it was unique because you got to pick your well, unsuitable that's was, boy. That's why he was unsuitable, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I th I've always thought of you as the power duo. Too bad ax isn't here to hear to hear that. Uh, so talk about that. You both were reaching higher. Uh, 
how did that inform you? How did that partnership and relationship inform you as you came to the Carlson School and achieved so much? I, I think, you know, the, uh, you know the, the thing about, I think, any long-term relationship. We've known, Ax and I have known each other for 50 years. I know many in the audience have had have similar stories, and we've been married for 45 years now. And through that, you know, it's been, you know, he followed me to Bombay, then I followed him to Nigeria, and then, you know, he followed me to the U U.S. and into academia. I think the first time we ever got anywhere together was to Minnesota, because when we were hired here, when we were recruited here, they somehow made us, there were two jobs at the Carlson School, and they made us feel that each one of us was the top candidate for each of those jobs. So nobody felt that we were following anybody around. But through all those, you know, some people might have thought of them as compromises, especially when the move to Nigeria, I was extremely reluctant to go. I had been a high-flying internal auditor at a Swiss pharmaceutical company reporting to the Swiss boss. I was the internal auditor of that firm. Axe at that point was brand manager for Colgate Toothpaste, which was the largest brand in India. But he got headhunted into becoming marketing manager for a consumer products firm in Nigeria, and it was an offer he couldn't refuse. And so I went there, we had a two-year-old, and I was looking for a job, and you know, Sandoz couldn't post me there, they, they didn't have an expatriate quota or something. But one of the, you know, and I suddenly found, they said, somebody said there's a new university in town. So access, access secretary typed up a resume, we went out there, I handed in my resume, and the, the dean secretary said, wait. Then she calls me back in like this, so I go in. And the dean looks up from my resume and he says, when can you start? <laughs> you know? So this was uh, my first introduction to academia, and I loved it. I loved the teaching. I had amazingly brilliant students. It was just a love fest all around. And I had already started writing at that point in a, in a strange coincidence with a connection to Minnesota. This was a magazine that was founded by Governor Orwell Freeman called Business International. And that was, again, I had started writing about multinationals. I mean, I'd worked in a multinational, Swiss multinational in India. And then in Nigeria, we lived in a town called Port Harcourt, which had one traffic light and some 60 multinationals from all over the world. It was an oil town. And so my interest in multinationals and the organization of multinationals, how multinationals were perceived in developing countries, it all grew out of that, and it led to my entire academic career. So it was every time we followed each other, I think there were you know, opportunities. I mean, people, you know, people think of it sometimes as compromises. I like to think of it as the sort of the origin of that word compromise as with promise. You know, every compromise comes with promise and opportunity. And that's kind of what happened with us. And so my entire academic career sort of started there. And then Axe followed me to Boston and got into an academic career. And today you wouldn't realize that I was the one who pulled him in that direction, <laughs> that he was all set. I mean, he was actually an interim CEO at this firm because uh, he joined as marketing manager and his CEO was uh, left, and so he was stuck as interim CEO there. Hated that job. And he you know, followed me to the US, and, and it was amazing. So, and he is now probably more a better teacher, a better scholar, a better academic in every way than I ever was or will be. So it's kind of been a, an interesting journey of following each other and, but, so, you know, and lifting each other up. It's, well, it's amazing. It's also the lesson in that remaining curious, uh, the fact that the, this idea of one single traffic light started your thinking about what you want to study and how the impact of growth and development on a community, understanding how businesses play a role. It's really extraordinary that you were always so observant mm -hmm. and curious, but also willing to walk through the next open door. Yeah. Um, and, and so it sounds like from your early years, you knew you had that sense of uh, responsibility for self and family uh, and, and education. Yeah. And, Lucky us at Carlson that you came here to instill that in all. Well, luck, lucky us for being here, you know, for coming to Minnesota. It was, the Carlson School was an amazing place. The intellectual quality of the faculty was off the charts. 
It is uh, one of the best places to start a research career, and I have, you know, no regrets at all. Well, I want to so take, I'm hoping, if you have further questions about her amazing life uh, and understanding of what makes a great leader, we should continue probing on all the experiences she had. We don't have time for all of that if I'm going to get to all of my questions. Um, so the next question, I want to kind of pivot and talk about the Carlson School. And you've had 30 years to be an observant actor in the changing dynamic of business education. I think it would be interesting for us, especially as you step into a faculty role, you know, what, what, is, what would you share with other leaders about that change and what you think is coming? And in light of that change, what are the treasures that you think you've left for that next leader as they take on the challenges of this changing dynamic? Well, I think the Carlson School is in a very, very strong place. I mean, we've had a, I've had an amazing team to work with and everything from whether the kind of uh, uh, you know, support we managed to uh, get for students you know, to provide access to education in terms of scholarships. I mean, the, we, I think we raised more than $100 million over in the Driven Campaign just for scholarships. So you know, when I became a, 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 a higher education uh, administrator, a, a head of higher education, you, one of the things you realize is that you're pulled in like a, a dozen different directions. I mean, there are, there's, you know, of course, central administration, but also faculty and staff and students and alumni and donors and, you know, just you name it. There are just so many different folks out there who have, you know, who want a piece of you and who feel that they own the school as well. And one of the things that, but it's, you know, the thing that has kept me grounded and made me sort of focus on what was important was there's just one, in my mind, VVIP in all of this, and that is the student, our students. And so every decision that I took, as long as I could keep in mind, how is this going to impact our students? This was something that it always you know, worked out just fine. And in that process, I think we've done a great deal, as I said, to make sure that there's access for the students. There's also, we've also set up all kinds of programs to help them thrive. Mm -hmm. But as you know, business education has changed, we've also had to change the curriculum, and faculty have been absolutely at the forefront of introducing new programs. I know Craig mentioned some of them earlier, but also just you know, the undergraduate curriculum, we now have an absolutely state-of-the-art curriculum focused on three pillars. One is people and planet, and the other is you know, critical thinking and problem solving, and the third is data and technology for decision making. And this is really, I think, we've just rolled that curriculum out this year. Again, our faculty have been extraordinary in get, making this happen. And so much of this is also driven by, I mean, in, in the undergraduate program, we're going to have a, at least two occasions for every undergrad to work on real problems for real clients. And that comes from this community that we're in, that we have such a great business community around willing to give us projects, willing to trust our undergraduates with projects for them. So that's been phenomenal. So I think the whoever comes next, there's a very strong foundation out here in terms of, you know, uh, the kind of services that we can deliver to our students, the quality of our faculty, second to none. You know, I think just uh, in every ranking, I you know, all deans hate rankings. That's just the you know, but the reality is that there's so many rankings out there, and if you look at any ranking of business faculty you'll find that the Carlson School faculty are absolutely on top. In the world, you know, we're ranked anywhere between in different subjects, different ways of ranking, anywhere from fourth. I think the worst ranking I've seen is 13th in the world. And so it's an extraordinary, <laughs> amazing. And, and, and I, I can't take credit for any of that, I have to tell you, but I, I'm the beneficiary of this, uh, you know, of the faculty quality. So the faculty quality and then the staff have been working so hard through the pandemic, through some, some of the most difficult years we've had to keep the ship, you know, running. So it's been an extraordinary, extraordinary effort on everyone's part. And I think so the school is in a very strong place and we just have to make sure that we can protect its uh, excellence. And one other thing that we, you know, we really have to start pay more attention to, and we've some, something that we've been paying attention to for a while, 
is to make sure that every student who comes through the door, again, the focus has to be on that student, feels a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And so we've launched our new Center for Inclusive Excellence and hired our first senior diversity officer, Dr. Angela Spranger. She's right there. Yeah. She's already making a difference. She's reached out to so many people I know, even in this audience who've met with her and you know, we, we want to raise the, you know, help make this whole community better. And that's always been my goal, and I hope that'll continue to be the goal of the Carlson School and the university. Yeah. Well, if you haven't met Angela, she is dynamic. So <laughs> you can just, you can see her smile from wherever you're sitting right now. Um, so impact is interesting. Deans hate rankings. When you have good rankings, I do know you send them around. <laughs> um, but I think that's true, and I think what I've found, again, in my gratitude for the leader that you are, is that when you celebrate, you're celebrating the impact that students are having, or alumni are having, or faculty are having. So maybe share a little bit, because it's palpable that that is what energized you. You talk about the core, the center being the student, right. and then it wraps to the faculty and around to community. But talk, tell us some stories, some of those moments of pride that you had from either students or faculty, uh, and and how you all of a sudden were able to look back and say, wow, by impacting this one individual, I'm having impact around the globe. No, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, the single thing that I'm most proud of, and again, I can't take credit for it, is that the entire school has absorbed this idea of business as a force for good. And it starts with the students, student projects. There's such interesting projects our students have done with Hennepin County, with Ramsey County, on identifying you know, transportation deserts in the Twin Cities, on identifying how a second harvest heartland can better market uh, the, the supplemental nutritional assistance program benefits to underserved communities, under-resourced communities around the state. Then our students have, you know, another student did her honors thesis recently on uh, mental health issues and you know, barriers to mental health access all through rural Minnesota. So these are the kinds of projects that our students love to do. And we're doing, the, you know, they're doing about 100 projects a year of this kind. Or, you know, and it's, it's only going to increase with the new undergraduate curriculum as well. We're probably going to double the number of projects that we're doing in the next year or two. And so it's been very, very heartening to, you know, just see the impact that our students are having and, and that our faculty too. Through, the, through COVID, you know, our faculty, across disciplines, you know, between the finance department and, and uh, the information decision sciences department, they put together the first hospitalization tracking project hmm. during COVID. You know, Health and Human Services didn't do it first. Our faculty did it first. And then later on, you know, of course, HHS, you know, jumped into the act. Steve may have some opinions on that, but we'll, we'll talk about it later. But it's, you know, it's amazing, the kind of work that our faculty have been doing as well, so these are things that really energize me, and I, you know, and I know that those will continue. The so focus on impact and social impact, impact on the business uh, community, of course, but also beyond that on society. Another of our students, and this is from one of our global programs. Very proud of our global programs as well. Uh, our Polish uh, executive MBA student Dorota Serapin, she's heading up. The, you know, uh, the Polish Humanitarian Action um, Institute, which is providing a whole lot of aid to Ukrainians coming in you know, as refugees from the war. So they've been doing a huge, she's been doing a huge, she's been leading that whole effort. So again, just worldwide, there is this, you know, this uh, idea that you know, business can and should be a force for good, and how can we use business principles to raise everyone in society? And that's been uh, such a you know, powerful message that we've, I think we've given. It's amazing, and a reminder to all of us, uh, those who are leaders, those who are studying and wanting to continue to lead, uh, to be able to find that core focus, and your focus is, is thinking about that students and that next generation of leaders, but then to, to find a way to show them their impact is much broader than business itself, is mm -hmm. what is the end, uh, and business is a force for good. You have to be so proud of instilling that so much and everyone who has worked around it, because it really has set Carlson apart. 
I want to change. We're going to come back to some of your pride points. Okay. Um, your impact has moved beyond the walls, n not just with the students and the faculty and others that you have impacted, uh, but you personally and professionally have decided to move outside of the walls. You served on the Guthrie board, Axe served on the orchestra board and community. You're chairing the Minneapolis Fed. Talk a little bit about that, why you chose to engage in that way with your personal time and how that then informed you as a leader and the things that you did. Well, Minnesota has been so much to us. Not only has it a place that we've both had outstanding careers, but you know, it's given us a country, it's given us a home. I've, we've lived in Minnesota for 31 years. I left India when I was 27. And so I've lived here longer than I've lived in India. So despite wow. the fact that I can't say oofda in the right way, but you know. <laughs> oofda. Oofda, okay. Oofda, I have to learn how to say it. But uh, the, you know, so we just felt that you know, and the community has been so good to us. And in doing this, we've learned from folks like you, Wendy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not exactly shy in you know, your engagement with the community. And we learn, we learn every day from all of you in this audience about how to give back to the community. And I've felt that every time we've engaged with the community, it's given us back so, in so many ways, not just personally, but also to the school, the connections that we've been able to make to the school through our engagement in organizations like United Way, the Guthrie, you know, the orchestra. You know, it's been constant, and I've, it's been one of the great joys and something that I, we hope to keep doing even after we, I get back to the faculty. And, and you've told me a little bit more on the work with the Fed. I've heard you talk about how that opened up your thinking about something that you decided to do here at the school in terms of a center for excellence. That, that's Share a little bit about that that's journey. True, yeah, that's right. No, I'm not going to tell you about what's happening with interest rates tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> no, wait, please do. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> If I only knew, <laughs> which I don't. But uh, the, I think joining the Fed board, again, it's been one of these amazing learning and growing experiences. I've learned so much. And working with President Neil Kashkari has been, again, one of the big joys of my wow. life right now. And it's, you know, and Neil led the charge to create an opportunity and inclusive growth institute at the Fed. And that was also a bit of the inspiration for our center for inclusive excellence, how can we, what can we do, you know, at the level of our students and the business community around us to, you know, promote this idea of inclusive excellence. Whereas at the Fed, you know, they're talking about inclusive growth, which is important to them. For us, it's about inclusive excellence and, you know, in, in uh, academia and business and in society. So it's, I think this, it was very much one of the seeds that kind of uh, was planted my, you know, as I was kind of, uh, chairing the Fed and their, all of their work on racism and the economy you know, has been very, very influential in thinking about how we think about these issues at the school itself. Mm -hmm. So it's been very, very helpful. Another great example of how important it is for all of us to lead in very different circles because it cross-pollinates and that we need to be aware because we're all one organic system. Right. Uh, and that's amazing. And. Um, the work that you've done and, and the work that's going forward in terms of a center for excellence and diversity and, and how we bring multiple perspectives is so critical. So um, let's talk a little bit more about, um, well, I don't want to go there yet. How much time do we have? 25 have, minutes. No, okay. <laughs> we have about five so, minutes left. In total. So. Five minutes. Five oh, minutes. five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Five minutes. Um, I got to see. And because then we're going to go to questions, correct? Yes. Um, I, I want to think about, we've been talking about this, but maybe we can, before I go to my last question, take all of that, this journey that you've been on um, and how you've op walked through open doors You've clearly been courageous. You've had an inner sense. It's clear that you weren't driven to have a list of wins, mm -hmm. um, but you were driven by an open door that allowed impact, yeah. and that you were often surprised by how far you were able to impact. Yes. 
and clearly had a sense of understanding what drives and inspires people. Mm -hmm. Take that for us and, and tell us, as a leader, of all those qualities, what do you think is the, the single most important quality that you've had to have that carried you through? I think it was two things. One is resilience. You know, I mentioned that earlier on. But sometimes I worry that, you know, um, people are too quick to sort of uh, blame others, blame, you know, circumstances every time something goes wrong. And sometimes, yes, it, it, it is others' fault. It is the system's fault. Sometimes it's your own fault. But I think what's much more important is the ability to sort of, you know, say, put that behind you and let's move ahead. You know, I think that quality has been very, very helpful. And another quality that has been, I think, I think something that I've learned over time is that, you know, it's, and I, I think I've said this somewhere before, but leadership, I think, is all about listening. Because you're going to make mistakes, you have to learn from people around you, you have to sort of listen to what their concerns are and try and see how you can help in what ways you can make things better for everyone around you. So I think that listening skill is was probably critical. Powerful. And uh, the resilience that I learned early on, I think from my father's experiences, I think those two were pretty critical in how kind of one navigates life. You know. Powerful, powerful. <laughs> she didn't know I was gonna ask that one. So uh, that's a powerful answer, I think. Listening is being observant and seeing the people around you, uh, and that clearly uh, helps you if you're going to inspire others. Resilience as a woman, uh, as a person of color, uh, anyone who is looking around the world, it is easy to get frustrated by the things around you. Right. But we all have to dig deep and find that self-resilience, and, and clearly uh, that is an important part for any leader. Right. We know it's no easy task to be a dean. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you found success because of that and so many other reasons. I want to, I know you all are waiting to hear that we're a little nervous because you're stepping down. We know you're going to be here because you're going to be in the faculty. But tell us, you're going to have time on your hands now. Uh, we want to know you're not going too far. We want to get a sneak peek into what, uh, what, what, how your curiosity is driving some of your next adventures. Ooh. So maybe share a little bit um, so that we all can feel comforted by the fact we know you will still be here impacting us all. Oh, I'm very much going to be here impacting us all. Believe me, I, I'm not going to leave that mid-century modern house anytime soon, you know. <laughs> I've been dreaming about it since I was 13 years old, so. <laughs> But um, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm looking forward to learning and growing more. I mean, it's, I think you have to keep learning and growing. And I, my work with, you know, on the HP Fuller board, I know there's several, you know, board members here today. And it's just wonderful to, you know, be on that board. There's so much that I'm learning there. I mentioned the Fed. It's, you know, I'll continue to chair the Fed uh, probably for the next year. My term ends at uh, December 23. I'm on the board of a, little New England college called Hamilton. I'm a life trustee there. And it's been fascinating because it's a, it's a first-rate liberal arts, small liberal arts, undergraduate-focused institution. But it shares so, there's so much in common with the Carlson School. And, and we are learning from each other all the time. I mean, we do some things better, they do some things better. And it's been great to sort of learn from that uh, experience as well. So I look forward to more kind of these kind of external engagements which will keep me busy. But also, my entire sort of scholarly work, I mean, I actually had a life as a scholar before I became <laughs> dean. And I was respected for it. And uh, I, I even have, I don't know, some 18,000 citations. That's about half, half as many citations as Axe has. But it's She not, doesn't not like rankings or numbers, but she has 18,000 citations. citations. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So and you have, have and you have some little and we people have in your little life. Little people, yes. I have four. We have four grandsons between the ages of one and a half and eight. So hopefully, we'll spend more time with them as well. So there is, I, I have a feeling that that calendar is going to get full up very quickly. I, I don't know where this all this free time is going to, you know, show up or whether it's going to actually be there. 
Well, well you're clearly, she's going to continue listening and learning uh, and impacting. And uh, I want to say that I'm again grateful to you and your leadership. But looking around the room, when you talked about the uh, choices that I've made in giving back to community, I can look at several people, the Lindals, the Goldbergs, and many others, and my mama, and this community. And so I want to take this moment on behalf of Sri. Our leaders don't succeed unless they have all of you supporting them. It is a really hard place that you have to have a lot of resilience to be a leader in this moment. And so I know, because in my conversations with Sri, she has talked about how this community wrapped her up and uh, enabled her. I, I can let you share in that. Thank you. But So I would say thank you to this community for um, being so incredible and, and caring about our institutions. Now I think we are opening it up for questions. Yes, we have. Um, oh, I, I have one more thing. What I have to tell you is this. My mother came up and whispered. She, we had gotten here. I drove with her. And we had gotten here. She hadn't coached me at all. Oh. But she said, Wendy, when you finish, after a career and all of the things that Sheree's done, what you should say is, now, Sheree, you can say, a job well done. <laughs> So I, I, a nod to my mother, she coached me, so I thought sure. I, would, I would respect her. And, and I liked my finish, but do you guys, did you like her finish better with the job well done? I don't know. I'm going to have you vote later, but now we'll go to questions. Yes, we've got our first in-person question here. We're going to alternate back and forth if our virtual audience has some as well. So Mark's going gonna... I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make this quick. Let me say my thank yous to Zaire Dean for all the time she's taken to talk to me about go for football and other things here at the school. <clears throat> Everything that I would have done in my career or have done in my career is not possible without Carlson School. Also, Marilyn Nelson Carlson, who I know is here today, I wouldn't have got in here without her, so thanks much. My question today is this. Who, who is that? I can't the word that. legacy uh, stands out today. If you want to be remembered at Carlson School, and there'll be a lot of positive good things, everyone in this room will have a bunch of things to say. How would you want to be remembered? And I want it to be positive. How would you want to be remembered here at Carl School? Wow. Whew, that's a tough one. I think legacy, these legacy uh, questions, it's for other people to decide, right? I mean, it's not so much for you to decide what your legacy is, but other people can then figure out what the legacy is much later. But I don't know, maybe that it was um, that our students left healthier, happier, more content with their lives, better educated, better prepared for the world. That might be a legacy that I would love to leave. Uh, the idea of business is a force for good. If it stays on, that would be no. wonderful. Thank you. We're going to make sure business is a force for good. Okay, hi, Dean here. My name is Maitri, and I'm the president of Carlson's Undergraduate Business Board. First of all, I just want to say thank you for speaking and for having us here, but my question is, you talked a lot about students, so for your perspective on student leaders and student advocates, at the end of your tenure, what do you feel that we've done well, and what work do we still have to do? Thank you. Wow, great question. Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I think one of the, the wonderful things about student leadership is this, the level of enthusiasm and optimism, and I just, uh, it gives me so much hope for the future, always to interact with students and student leadership. I think always a frustrating thing about these things in, 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 in an educational context is the students leave after four years. The leadership changes every two years, so you know, you're, you're kind of constantly sort of, uh, I mean, it's great to see the refreshing of the leadership, but it's also, uh, uh, a sense of loss each time because, you know, you just build a relationship with somebody and then they move on to better things. But it's wonderful when students stay connected with the school. You know, after, the, you know, I, the message I'd give to the business board leadership is do what Craig Schmidt did. You know, stay connected. He's, he was one of the founders of the original Gophers of the last decade board, the Gold Board, and he has stayed connected with us, and you know, he's been the first donor 
after the lead gift to our building the reimagination project. So that's the kind of. That's the kind of pride and engagement and stewardship from our alumni, which makes me so happy. But anything the business board can do to make sure that your, the students stay connected as you go out into the world, that would be hugely helpful to us. Thank you so much for your answer. My name is Nico. I'm also a member of the business board here in the undergraduate program. And I wanted to touch back to something you mentioned on the importance of students as sort of the focus at the Carlson School. I was kind of wondering throughout your tenure, as you have donors and faculty and external community stakeholders, how do you make sure that students stay in the focus as you develop initiatives and policies? Uh, well, you know, as we make decisions, there sometimes there are trade-offs, right? And I've always tried to see if there's a trade-off, if there's a decision between investing in A versus investing in B. My question is always, which has more of an impact on students? So those are the kinds of ways in which I think the, you know, uh, we want to stay engaged with students. But then having the student voice heard as well is very important to us. So organizations like Business Board and all of the student clubs that are there at this uh, school are very, very important to sort of uh, to uh, make sure that students are heard and students are engaged in the process. And uh, so that's the, you know, a little bit of what we try to do. We can always do more, but I think that's how we try and stay in touch with students. Who else has a question for Sheree? Our online audience today is a little quiet. You've answered everything, We've Sheree. got one in the back. Oh, perfect. Thank you. you. Might you address what you've done for the veterans at the Carlson School of Business? The, for the? Sorry. For the veterans. Veterans. The, oh, absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, that's one of the things that I'm very proud of as well. And it, again, goes back to childhood experiences. My brother, who is 16 years older than me, was, uh, you know, was a, a, in, the, in the Indian Army. He retired finally as a general some years ago, but as a five-year-old, I remember this handsome 21-year-old young man, you know, dressed in his uniform, coming in, and it was something that meant so much to me to have a, you know, brother in the military. And my father, too, you know, before he became, a, um, uh, came back to India, he was actually, he, uh, you know, served in the Burma theater in the, in, the, in, the, in the Second World War. And so the result is I've always had a fondness for the military and for anyone who serves, I think that they do an amazing job and we have to thank them every day. And so when Bill Walter and Bill Van Dyke came to me, you know, about 11 years ago and said, you know, we would like to start a program to support veterans. I said, absolutely, let's do it. And they stepped up and so many others in this room stepped up as well and we managed to raise significant funding as well as programming support for our veterans. We recruited a, a Navy veteran to sort of be the face of this program, Chip Altman. And so it was kind of a, a really, um, uh, it's been very heartening to me about we've now helped about 120 veterans, you know, make, you know, come into uh, civilian lives <coughs> through the Veterans Initiative. And we've also you know, being able to sort of, I think now about 20 or 25% of our MBA program is veterans, you know, is composed of veterans. So it's been fantastic. <coughs> Sorry. And share a little bit, Shri, the program itself, but how the veterans have impacted. I mean, it, it's a gift that keeps giving. It's Absolutely. changed the dynamic in the school. Totally. So it's not, it's, it's not been one way at all. You know, the school, the community has learned so much from the veterans coming in. And they have changed the culture of the classroom as well, especially in the MBA program. They, you know, uh, Axe used to teach the core strategy class every year. And he came, you know, the first year we had, you know, a couple of veterans. He said, you know, wow, these guys are always sitting in the front row and they've got their hands up all the time. <laughs> and I know Phil Miller loves to tell the story of, yes, the I-Core immersion core or the you know, the first core um, uh, set of co core classes in the MBA program is very intense, very hard. But I know Phil loves to tell the story of how one veteran had told him that, hey, listen, 
I'm not in a foxhole, I'm not cold, I'm not being shot at. This isn't hard, I mean, being in a class. And so that whole culture, you know, has permeated the school as well. So if everyone is better prepared, everyone is more ready to sort of take the initiative, things like that. So it's been a wonderful addition to the school. Also, I think for a lot of our students, many of them had never met a veteran before. Hmm. And just, you know, having that conversation, I believe very much in having conversations across different groups of people. And so that's been a kind of diversity that has also been very, very valuable to us. So that's, uh, you know, Amazing. absolutely the gift that keeps on giving. Amazing. Are there any other? We have one more. Hi, my name is Akini. My name is Akini Williams, and um, I have a question. Yesterday I was guest lecturing a class on gender and finance. Why okay. are there not more women in, in, finance. <laughs> in finance? And as we left this class, we're thinking, what is the reason you know, more women are not in finance? And, and how is it that we can get the fire? We didn't see the fire in the students. Coming from Kenya and growing up with meager, you know, some of the themes that are similar to yours, right. I feel like it was, a, it was hard to teach them the, the oomph you know, come to the office kind of thing. And how do you deal with this battle? I don't know if it's generation, or are you just glad you're done with it and you don't have to deal with it anymore? <laughs> no, I think it's something we've been working on all the time to try and get more women into technology careers, to get more women in finance. And there have been many, many initiatives that we continue to do. And, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, conversations with the Forte Foundation. We you know, partner with them. There are just a lot of ways we are tra trying to attract more women into these more, you know, technology or finance-oriented type careers. Um, I think, you know, why are we succeed not, or not succeeding as much as we would like to? I think that's a huge sociological question. I don't know that I have, you know, all the answers to that. But I think we just have to keep chipping away, and I'm, I'm glad you're here pushing the case as well. And the more voices there are speaking up for women in these careers, I think that the better it'll be. We should also connect you with Marsha Page, who is, uh, spoke at First Tuesday and shared all the statistics and some of the things that she's doing. Um, so somehow find me and I'm gonna connect you uh, with Marsha. We have, we have one more question here. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm Stacy Ackerman with Wells Fargo. And one of the questions that's on my mind are the headwinds that higher education is facing today, whether it's high student loan debt. Uh, we have a demographic cliff coming in 2025. Um, there's very much this value proposition around higher ed. And I think all of us here, we're, we're big believers in education. That's how we got to be where we are today. But how do we continue to innovate and make sure that we, we stay relevant for this next generation of students and to, to benefit ultimately our society? I think that's a great question. Two minutes or less, you've got to answer that. Two minutes or less, absolutely. <laughs> it's a great question. It is, it's a great question. I think it's on every higher education leader's mind. Um, I think the way we stay relevant is by engaging, you know, making sure that the outcomes for our students remain very, very strong. And there, I think the Carlson School excels. I mean, our students are snapped up. I think 98% of our undergrads were placed within 90 days of graduation. Similar kind of numbers in the MBA and MS programs. And some of what we've done in terms of introducing new programs, new certificate programs, has been this business of constantly trying to innovate to meet the needs of the market, what, what does industry want from our students? And that's what we're trying to deliver also in our new undergraduate curriculum. So that's been a big part of it. And another big part of it is to make sure that, you know, that we keep our costs under control, that we run efficiently. So you know, all of these new programs that we're introducing, we've created a sort of a platform and we're sort of being able to sort of um, uh, cross-train people across different programs and recruitment and admissions and all of that, and that's an ongoing effort to try and be more efficient in our delivery. I mean, I'll tell you that when, you know, when I started as dean, we probably had somewhere, something over 4,000 students. We today have 5,000 students. 
we still have the same number of tenure track faculty. We still have 103, 104 tenure track faculty, and, we st and it's 20% more students. So we are becoming more efficient in how we deliver, and without diluting the experience for the students. It was, you know, some of it was just simple, you know, operation stuff, like looking at, uh, you know, we ended up, you know, we'd have classes clapped at 65 and find that we had, you know, six sections of 50, when we could easily have five sections of 60. You know, I mean, it's, it was things like that, that we kept doing through the years, and we've constantly continued to, you know, make sure that we're delivering efficiently, but we're also not, you know, diluting the experience for our students, and uh, making sure that, that, you know, the scholarship, uh, uh, scholarships are available, they're the philanthropy of everyone in this room, I know, has contributed in some way or the other, and the, you know, the sort of we've tripled the scholarships in the undergraduate program already, even as the pledges are still coming in. And we have the Centennial Scholarship Program, raised 50 million for that, over 100 million for scholarships in the course of the Driven Campaign. So I think these and things, and this happened with, because of all of you. It didn't no. happen because of us. It's each of one of you has been responsible for helping us out with that. And we have to. I mean, you know and I know how important education is, but how do we make sure that that stays strong for the next generation? And yeah, so I mean, and, and I guess that's it. But what, you know. I, what I love hearing, I know <laughs> we're, we're probably gonna end, the, they'll take the hook, but we're not seeing the time like the Hollywood Awards. Um, uh, one thing that I think is really important in that question that I loved hearing in Shree's answer, and I hope all the leaders will follow suit, is that as we redirect to try and create certificate programs and other things for the immediate needs of the competencies, that we don't forget that having a global mindset matters and we do our global learning, that we don't forget that ethics matter and we stop teaching ethical leadership. Those are the things that Shri has done at the Carlson School. Those are the things that are critical. Good. And so I hope that, um, I know that you've cemented that in the DNA, um, and I thank you for that. Well, so, th Well, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, all of you. I see so many friends here, so thank you for being here. Thanks to What a fascinating fireside chat. Thank you, Wendy, and, and thank you so much, Sri, for uh, sharing your journey and perspective with us today. You have been an incredible advocate for the Carlson School over the past decade as dean. It has been a pleasure learning more about you today. You've laid a great foundation for the next dean. Your legacy as a business, as a force for good, will not be forgotten. And definitely, a job well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah.